Arunang karuna tarangitakshi Drita pasang kusha pushpa bana chapam Anima di biravritam mayukhai Raham mityeva vibhavaye bhava Sumeru Madhya Sringastha Sriman Nagaranayika Chintamani Grihantastha Pancha Brahmasana Stita Mahapadmata Visangstha Kadambhavanavasini Namaste And welcome to another blissful episode. <laughs> of Sri Lalita Sahasranama. So, we have finished now with the description of her form from the head to the feet and even the way she walks and everything. Now, the Vach Devi's turn to a description of her abode where she lives, where she stays. So, Nama 55, Sumeru Madhya Shringastha. So, from 55 to 63, they describe her abode. Sumeru means the mountains that are beyond the Himalaya. Uh, in the Vedic cosmology, the Bhu Mandala centers on the Himalayas. But the Meru mountains are even beyond the Himalayas. They're in another dimension. We can't see them with these eyes, but they're there. And there are three mountains, three mountains on top of which the abodes of Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva are located. And in the midst of these three, which form a triangle, there's another mountain, which is higher. And that's where her abode is located. Now, of course, skeptics are going to say, well, nobody has ever seen this place. Oh, yeah? <laughs> you chant this Sahasranam for a while and then watch your dreams, okay? Enough said. So the three peaks are described by Durvasa Muni in his wonderful poem, Lalita Stavaratna. I salute the three shorter peaks, which are the abodes of Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. In the midst of these peaks, there is another peak much higher than the other three. Golden rays are beautifying this peak, and I worship it. So, of course, this is the description of Sri Chakra. Sri Chakra is the golden city, which is depicted in the Sri Yantra. Uh, the, this is the design of the city, these interlocking triangles. And this is also a wonderful uh, diagram, a metaphor, for the entire cosmological system. It's beyond our scope here to get into a detailed study of it, but just know that it's there. <laughs> and is waiting for you. So, on this topmost peak, she lives with her beloved, Sri Kameshwara, and she reigns the goddess of the universe as Sri Mate Kameshwari. <laughs> Next, Nama 56, Sri Man Nagara Naika. So she owns this very beautiful city, Sri Nagara, or Sri Chakra. And this is described in the uh, Lalita Stavaratna, as we quoted above, and another in the Rudra Yamala. Huh? These are so cool. 
that the uh, Sri Nagara was constructed by the heavenly architect Vishvakarma, and it stands in the midst of the ocean of milk on an island called Ratna Dweep. And I, Ratna means precious stones, jewels, and Dweep means island. So on this island of precious stones and jewels sits this golden city in the shape of these interlocking triangles. That's the top view. Huh? And the side view looks more like a mountain. Hmm. Anyway. <laughs> so are these two descriptions contradictory? No, not at all, because what is the ocean of milk? I experienced the ocean of milk in 1984. That Shakti came to me in her uh, nirguna form, her invisible form, and touched my third eye. I felt it quite clearly. And I found myself in an ocean of consciousness. And it looks like milk. It's sort of translucent. It's there, you can see it, it's effulgent, but you can see through it. And you, I, I saw everything in Brahman, and Brahman in everything, as if this ocean of milk was just uh, saturating everything. Uh, so consciousness is everywhere and in everything. And we have to see like that to have a vision of reality. And in the midst of this ocean of consciousness, there's her city. Because she is consciousness personified. So Sri Nagara is the outskirts of Sri, uh, Sri Vidya or Sri Chakra. Uh, same difference which is her seat of universal government, and she performs all her functions from there. Next, Chintamani Grihantastha. Chintamani is a heavenly gem. It's a wish-fulfilling gem, that whatever you wish while touching a Chintamani, you will get. So she lives in a palace made of Chintamani. Huh? There's a really interesting story about a great devotee of Krishna, Rupa Goswami. Rupa Goswami had been given a chintamani, a touchstone, and he threw it in the trash. <laughs> so one time a thief was sneaking around his cabin and he's looking through the trash, you know, and he found this touchstone. And he said, oh, this is it. I'm set. And he took the touchstone, started turning everything into gold. You know, <laughs> he was really living it up. And then one day it hit him. The touchstone was in the trash. So that means he has even something more valuable in his house. And I, since I am such a great thief, I will go and steal it. <laughs> So he went to Rupa Goswami and because he knew he was honest, the thief was very straightforward and said, Rupa, I know, I know you've got something hidden here that's even more valuable than a touchstone, <laughs> even more valuable than Chintamani. And he said, yes, I have devotion to God hidden in my heart. And you can have it too. So he initiated the thief, and the thief became a great devotee. <laughs> I love these stories. So anyway, this is the origin of all mantras. This is the origin of all good fortune. And by chanting these names, one comes into contact with that source. And this is even better than touchstone. Pancha Brahma Sanastita. Now, this is a little tough one, okay? She is seated on a throne made of five Brahmans. That's the literal meaning. Huh? The five Brahmans are Lord Brahma, Vishnu, Rudra, Ishana, and Sadashiva. 
And some commentators say Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, Mahadev, and Sadashiva. But anyway, some of these are forms of Shiva, and then there's Brahma and Vishnu. So all the three Murti are included, all the principal demigods. So each form represents different acts of Brahman, creation, sustenance, and, and so on. There's a shloka from the uh, Saundarya Lahari. Brahma, Vishnu, Rudra, and Ishwara form the support of your throne, and Sadashiva is the seat of your throne. So this affirms that she is the highest authority in the universe. She is higher even than the Trimurti, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. She is where the buck stops. She is responsible for everything. Creation, maintenance, destruction, the pralaya, the interregnum, the, the state between creations, and the recreation at its end. She is responsible for the karmas of all the conditioned souls. And she is responsible, in fact, she is the substance of the universe, which is consciousness. Then beyond that, she is also the five elements. The five Brahmans also represent the five elements. That is Akash, or space, air, fire, water, and earth. So she is the mistress of these five elements, and she is the five elements. So she certainly controls the elements and all of the uh, manifestations in the creation, like that. What this means is, because the chakras in the human body also represent the five elements, and we're not going to get into the five element theory and very deeply and all that here. But just know that in general, one has to cross or conquer or master or control all these five elements before one can realize her. And of course, the last one is the Agnya Chakra, and that's Akasha or space. One has to master the space, the emptiness. And this is why that Lord Shiva recommends, and also Buddha recommends, that one should meditate on emptiness. And then this is the final uh, test. And when one has satisfied her, and when and has conquered even this element of emptiness and space, then she gives the final realization. Mahapadmatavi Sangsta. She dwells in a great forest full of lotus flowers. See, in the spiritual world, in the Sri Chakra, nature is very beautiful because she is the source. She is Mother Nature. So all the nature around her is very opulent and wonderful, full of blooming lotus flowers and crystal ponds filled with swans. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. No? So really, one should aspire to be liberated and to join her in her abode. And this is the highest enjoyment. In the Sahasrara, uh, there is a tiny hole called the Brahmarandra. And Brahmarandra is the hole through which the liberated soul leaves the body uh, after being a Jivan Mukta in the present body, the liberated soul leaves the body through this hole and goes to the spiritual world. Uh, my Adi Gurus, 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 Guru, Bhaktivinoda Thakur, was present at the death of a, a very powerful yogi and saw actually this hole blast out from uh, within his head at the time of his death. So uh, when my sannyas guru left his body, 
Uh, unfortunately, he had a lot of hair. <laughs> He'd been growing his hair for a long time. It was quite long. So uh, there was no way to inspect and see uh, if the Brahma Rundra had been uh, blown, had been breached. But anyway, this is a very common symptom of liberated souls. And finally, Kadam Bhavana Vasini. She lives in the middle of a forest of Kadamba trees whose flowers have divine fragrance. So her palace of Chintamani is surrounded by beautiful gardens with pools of crystal water filled with lotus flowers and visited by divine swans. And around that is a forest of Kadamba trees whose flowers are extremely fragrant and beautiful. Chintamani Griha is actually a complex of palaces and walls. And again, it follows the pattern of the Sri Yantra. Uh, so each of these walls encloses a, a big space wherein certain goddesses and gods dwell. And they serve particular purposes in the administration of the universe. And of course, she has her lions and other weapons by which she enforces her decrees. Uh, so uh, we have something to do with that. <laughs> it's interesting that all these uh, triangles intersect each other in the space between the seventh and eighth walls. Uh, and they make actually 12 secondary triangles which represent the 12 Vedic months of the year, the solar months. See, the Vedic calendar has two actually uh, intersecting calendars, the solar calendar of 12 months with an occasional intercalary month to make up the difference between the sun and the moon, and the lunar calendar of 27 nakshatras, so this is a very intricate subject, which we won't get into here, but I just want to point out that all of these topics, all these deep, deep, profound Vedic topics are referenced here in the thousand names of the goddess. So what we have here is like a key to the whole Vedic knowledge, huh? that everything in the universe finds its center and focus in the goddess, because she is the substance of this universe. Aum Tatsat, Aum Shakti Aum.